So this is my first PowerPoint presentation, so please bear with me. I had a lot of fun putting it together. And I titled it Georgia the Country and the Night in the Panther Skin. And the reason I call it Georgia the Country is when I first started going to Georgia, I've been five times now, and I'd say, I'm going to Georgia. And everybody would say, why? And, and I'd say, no, the country. Oh, oh OK. So uh, I, this is about, first, a little background of Georgia the country. And then I'll talk about The Night in the Panther Skin, which is a fascinating, fascinating poem. And then after break, I would like to talk about English poetry, a sort of a huge uh, skip through English poetry. So first of all, the latest mention of Georgia in the press was in Time, am I blocking anybody's view here? Time Magazine, um, and April 17th it's dated, so we haven't even caught up to them yet. But anyway, there's a mention of Georgia as a, the, on the highway, on the drug trafficking highway, which is unfortunate, but I thought you'd like to know that I always keep up on Georgia in the news. So this is my map that I included from the internet showing you the Black Sea. And uh, Georgia's this little country. It's sort of uh, on the, they think of themselves as European. And I feel very much like I'm in Europe when I'm in Georgia. But they're surrounded, as you see, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Everybody would definitely put them in Asia. But Georgia is kind of a, an anomaly. And this uh, map doesn't show you the other side. So I show you this thing. Now this is, Georgia is between the mountain ranges, the Caucasus and between the Black Sea on the west and the, the Caspian Sea on the east with only Azerbaijan in that valley as you see between the two mountains. And I think that's why their language, it's called an autolect. It's one of like seven in the world. It's not related to any major language family. It, it's only for itself. It's only in that region, uh, a little bit in Iran, a little bit in Azerbaijan, but it's Local, I think, because it was cut off from the world from the, by the seas and the mountains. This is the language that I think looks most like Georgian. It's not Georgian. Does anybody recognize this language? This is J.R.R. Tolkien's elvish language <laughs> that he made up for the Lord of the Rings. But you'll see it has a lot of similarities, so maybe he used Georgian, too. So here is the Georgian alphabet. It looks a lot like Elvish, I think. Um, what, what really impresses me is the roundedness of the letters. But I've traveled the world around, and I've been to Russia, and I've been to India, I've been to many, many places in the world. And Georgia was the first place that I went to where I really couldn't understand a word on the shop signs and so forth. For example, in Moscow or Russia, there are a lot of anglicized words. And if you know a little bit of Cyrillic, you can learn to translate it so they have you know, Kino and uh, Coca-Cola. But in Georgia, I would look at the street signs, and I wouldn't know the first thing about what was what. Here's the showing you the modern version. And um, you can see underneath, it's just phonetically. So one good thing about Georgia is it's always pronounced the same way. Letters which are impossible to say, but if you once learn to say them, you can always say them. So I don't know if you know in English, we have, for example, the, the, the sound, the diphthong O-U-G-H, and it can pr pronounce seven different ways. Uh, let's see, cough, rough, um, slew, uh, and so on. So you have seven different ways of pronouncing that letter combination. This is very baffling to foreigners trying to learn English. But in Georgia, if you have a certain combination of letters and it sounds that way in one word, it will always sound that way. So this says, right underneath, it's the first letter is T-B-I-L-I-S-I. -I -I. So you see the I's there, the three I's. So once you get that upside down U as an I, you always have that. And the, these are the towns. And Gori is a town I'm going to talk about a little bit more um, when we get to it. So this is a kind of a typical view of Georgia. Uh, you see the high mountains. You see the church, the landscape. Um, there's a, the, an old granary. It used to be kind of a fortress. Uh, and that's a, a view. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. And it has even 
uh, sub, kind of subtropical forests in one area, but I'm not going to talk about that. This is a picture that I took from uh, uh, a church um, uh, high up on a, a shvari. It's called Cross, and it's one of the oldest churches in Georgia. And of course, here, uh, you know, in Europe, I remember my first experience going with my dad as a high school student to Europe and noticing the difference when they said something was old and when we said something was old. That's the first shock I think that Americans get. You know, it's like 1776 is not old in Europe. Well, in Georgia, it's the European old is not even old. <laughs> Here it's really, really old, so going way back to BC. Uh, and notice the red roofs of the village. Um, there's the lack, I think it's kind of fun that they miss the telephone wire age. So they were lucky enough, they didn't start getting telephones until the age of the cell phone, by and large. So now they don't have any telephone wires uh, and very few power wires. This is a sort of a slightly colored picture of Tbilisi. Tbilisi was named by um, a British travel magazine as one of the top 10 destinations, tourist destinations. I encourage you all, if you haven't been to Georgia, this is not Russia, this is Georgia, and it's a real experience. I'm a Georgio Georgiophile. If it weren't for the fact that my family is here, I think I would move to Georgia. I love the country. So notice how it's colored. You can see a modern bridge and so forth, but this is the other side of Georgia. <laughs> this is in the country, a small village called Choporti, right outside Tbilisi. This is a bus stop, and a cow decided to take advantage. <laughs> and apparently he counts on the, and every time she counts on the bus stop being there, when the summer day gets hot, she just wanders into the bus stop, and it's a feature of, of rural living. And this is the other one. <laughs> this is a family pig in Choporti. A lot of the villages have their own pig-like dogs. And um, I thought it was interesting that black is a sign of interbreeding with wild boars. So if you see the coloring, it's very different than our pinkish pigs, um, very gray and white. So this is the family pig. This is the other side, the very, very modern. This is a, a building. It's uh, designed as a music center um, under the rule of Saakashvili. I think some of you will know about him. He was a very Western-leaning, very, uh, he went to Yale school and uh, very powerful and very successful until during one of my visits there was a prison scandal and that just sort of wiped him out of office. But he designed this building and it's got won all kinds of architectural awards. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the architect. But um, it has yet, yet to be opened. <laughs> So nobody's been inside, but uh, it's kind of a dinosaur in its way because nobody knows, can afford to actually get it started. But it is an arresting sight when you're standing in a bunch of cobblestone streets with the old pink, have the orange roofs, and then you look on the horizon and see this. This I've got to mention right off the bat. So what distinguishes Georgians? Georgians are known throughout the world, and I can affirm it, that they're most generous people in the world. They are, they'll, maybe Americans are second, but Georgians are so generous. And I have to tell you this little story. When I was having dinner at a hotel, and there was a Georgian woman I'd been trying to meet. And I was at this hotel as kind of a comfort time, because it's very expensive, but it had an English menu, and I just wanted to be among English speakers. So I said, I got the idea, maybe she could join me for dinner. So I called her and she said, well, I can't be there until much later. Go ahead and I'll join you for coffee. So I had this wonderful big meal and at the end of the meal, she, she showed up and we had coffee. And when I went to pay, she had paid. Because I was her guest, even though she only had a cup of coffee. And it doesn't matter how much you protest, they will, they will just go all out to, to do everything. Georgians are famous for what's called a supra. This is a super, 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 supra. And it has about 27 dishes. Oh, I didn't show you that, so let's see if I can back up. So it has 27 dishes, it, uh, but they're all 
what, one thing you discover when I first arrived and I sat down and they gave me this big dinner course that looked like this and I ate until I couldn't eat anymore. Then they cleared the table and brought the second course. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> I can't eat anything. So, um, but the interesting thing to me is that the Georgian cuisine, although it's very varied, uh, they like to have the same things over and over and over. So if you can imagine like Thanksgiving dinner or whatever, whatever you like for Thanksgiving dinner, the turkey, the mashed potatoes, you would always have exactly that. And for me, that's kind of strange. And when I was there this time, my fifth time to Georgia, their two famous foods are King Kali and Kachapuri. And Kachapuri is kind of like a Georgian pizza. It's a, like pizza in a dough pocket or something. It's delicious, and they have many, many different kinds of kachapuri. But on my fifth trip there, at the end of the thing, somebody said, oh, have you tried kachapuri? <laughs> Only about a 1,000 times. <laughs> and they do the same with King Kali. They want to introduce you to King Kali, although you have. So this is just a little bit. And the interesting thing for me, I took this picture, was that there were only three of us at this table. So <laughs> you can imagine. OK. This is a little known fact about Georgia, that it's famous for its wine. It's one of the greatest, you know, I think it challenges France. It has a white wine, red wine, and it has a special favorite of mine. It's called black wine. And you go into the countryside, and they have these little stores that sell you wine. They, they have on tap, like these huge barrels, and they'll pour it right into a, a, a cleaned out Pepsi bottle or something and give it to you. It's very cheap, and you have wonderful wine. So this is their. This is another thing that I like. We're getting to the end of the Georgia introduction. This is Churchella. This is a combined. This is a dessert. But again, this is like Kachapuri. They have one thing, Churchella. So if you go on the streets, you'll see Churchella shop after Churchella shop. Not very much chocolate, not very much care, but Churchella. But it's all these different flavors. And basically, it's made of uh, grape juice and nuts. And they keep dipping strings of nuts into grape juice and letting it harden and letting it harden. And eventually, you get this kind of like dried fruit candy called Churchella. And they, um, it used to be very useful for Georgian soldiers because it, didn't, it was not perishable. It would last for a very long time, so they'd go through. OK, then we're getting, this is Georgia's a very religious country. 80% of the Georgians, 80% of a country, almost 5 million, uh, last tally, uh, identify themselves as Georgian, uh, Georgian Christians, Georgian Orthodox. And I think part of this is because they went through a Russian occupation when Russia tried to stifle all religion. It was forbidden to have any religion anywhere in any school or anything. And as a result, now when the Russians left, their religion surged up. So you see a lot of Georgian Orthodox churches. And one thing that's striking to me is that the Georgians, many, many Georgians cross themselves whenever they see or go past a church. And they cross themselves in the reverse way that we're used to. Um, and I talked to a friend of mine. She said, well, but I'm not religious. I said, well, but every time you go past a church, you cross yourself. And she said, I do that because of my family, to honor my family to honor my tradition. I don't actually, I'm not a believer, but I do that. So I thought this was interesting. This is the patriarch, Ilya II. I almost met him. Uh, he's the, probably the most popular man in Georgia. Um, over 90% of the people feel that he's, uh, you know, he is a wonderful moral leader, and he's the head of the Georgian Orthodox Church. OK, now we're getting to the history of Georgia. This is. One of Georgia's, I think of the two, she has a, Georgia has a mother and a father. And they're both of them unfortunate for such a wonderful Pacific country. Does anybody recognize this picture or no? OK, this is Medea. Now, Medea was the princess of Colchis. And Colchis what is in Georgia. Colchis was part of Georgia. So when Jason goes to get the Golden Fleece and comes back with Medea and the Golden Fleece, that's Georgia he's going to. Um, and I wonder, so she's famous for getting mad at Jason and serving up their children to him in a feast. So 
she's an unfortunate person, but she is the old, sort of the oldest mythical, I think of as the female line. This, somebody sent me this picture of a woman washing, I thought it said washing the fence, but it's not washing the fence. Do you know what that is? Yes, it's a fleece. And I put that here because they still, to this day, take the fleece and wash it. Jason and the Golden Fleece, it's called the Golden Fleece because they used to use fleece for, for gold panning in the rivers. So they'd have this river full of gold flowing down to the sea and they'd have this fleece and they'd do the fleece and the water would flow through the fleece and leave behind the particles of gold. So a really good fleece, <laughs> the better the fleece was, the more gold in its color. So this is an actual, presumably like an actual fleece that was famous as being the best gold catcher and that's what he had to get. And she's washing a fleece here. This is the other ancestor. If you recognize this picture, I can't pronounce his, he was Georgian. Yosef uh, uh, Danielovich, <laughs> um, and he was born in Gori, the town, the picture that I showed you. And the story that I love about this is that they were, you know, when they took down, after the fall of Stalin and Lenin, they took down all the statues. But the town of Gori kept up their really big statue of Stalin right in the marketplace. And as you drove past on the highway, you'd see this big statue of Stalin. So the government said to them, we're going to take it down. And the people in Gori said, if you take it down, you're going to have a big revolt here. Because he was our native son, and yes, he was a bad guy, but he was very powerful and very important. And he's the only one from Gori that anybody's ever heard of. <laughs> so we want our statue. So they debated how to do it. And there's an old Jewish proverb that says, where there are two alternatives, take the third. So one alternative was to take the statue away and risk the revolt of the, patient, of, the, of the people. The other was to leave it where it sat and stood and risk the tourists being offended and asking why are you still celebrating Stalin. So what they did was they sent in a SWAT team in the middle of the night and they took the statue off its base and they carried it about half a mile to the back of the town museum and put it in a grove of, of trees. <laughs> So if you go to Gori today, you can still see Stalin. He's still in the town. It's only half a mile away, but you have to pay a little bit to go to the museum, and you have to go, and you have to want to see Stalin's statue. Then you can see it. <laughs> so I think that's good ingenuity. So now we get to our main guy. This is Shota Rustavelli. Shota Rustavelli was a 12th century sorry, 12th century monk, perhaps. Um, but he wrote the epic poem that I'm going to talk about, The Night in the Panther Skin. This is Georgia's national epic, though it doesn't mention Georgia anywhere in the epic. It's kind of interesting. And it's considered to be a work of the Georgian Orthodox. People certainly consider it to be a work of George, Georgian orthodoxy, although it doesn't mention Jesus anywhere in the book. It doesn't mention Georgian orthodoxy, Jesus, anything. But everybody w likes to lay claim to him. And uh, he was uh, about the same time as uh, a ruler in Georgia, and her name was Tamar. And she was such a, she was the only, she was a, a, a ruler of a country in the 12th century, if you can imagine that. She inherited the kingdom from her father, sort of like King Lear, but it went right. <laughs> and she was so admired that she was called King Tamar, which is kind of like King Betsy. <laughs> OK, this is a panel from a monastery in Jerusalem, which the old panel shows it as it was before. Uh, it was, uh, this is supposed to be Shota Rustavelli's portrait here. And people place a lot of weight on that because it's the only image that we have that's possibly of Rustavelli from the 12th century. And if it is right, then he's pictured as a member of the court, as a nobleman. He's not pictured as a monk. 
Uh, and then this is what happened in 2004 when Saakashvili was to, going to go to Jerusalem um, before his visit a vandal destroyed a lot of the, a lot, just that, just that panel. So obviously it was intentional, Saakashvili was coming and the, one of the suppositions, there, nobody really knows, but some of the people feel that this monastery is now run by the Greek Orthodox Church. It was sold to them in I think the 1700s. Yeah, the Georgian, Georgians always need money and they sold this to the Greeks. And one of the suppositions is that one of the Greek monks did this too, but that's just a rumor. This is King Tamar, um, a very formidable person. And Rustavelli spends time in the prologue um, I think you can tell, like between the lines, he says, it's kind of difficult to be in love with a woman who, if you make her mad, she can not only wipe you out, wipe your family out, wipe your village out, thousands of men could die because you got her mad. <laughs> it's kind of a burden. But she was a very, very strong ruler and ruled very successfully until her death. Uh, this is, uh, does anybody recognize this? This is uh, Cordelia. This is, a, I put that in to show, so Tamar was sort of like the successful Cordelia. So we have King Lear giving his kingdom, but in, in Rustavelli he talks about Rostovan giving his kingdom to his daughter and how well that turned out. Okay, this is a, an English knight. Uh, I wanted to bring this in because Georgian knights are not like King Arthur's knights. Uh, and one big difference, that just saying this one thing will let you know this, they cry a lot. They cry all the time. They cry not only when things don't go so well for them, but when things don't go so well for their friend. You're supposed to be sympathetic and cry. If your friend's having a bad day, you cry. And if you don't feel like crying, you scratch your face or beat your head on a wall until you feel like crying <laughs> to show everybody. But English knights, you know, very stoic. They don't uh, show much emotion. It's all rational, it's all. Uh, Georgian knights, I would say, are very much in touch with their feminine side, as well as the Georgian women in the knight in the panther skin are very much in touch with their masculine side. So this is the knight in the panther skin. This is one of the images that show him on a good day. This is Tariel. He's known to every Georgian. If you go to Georgia, you just stop anybody, almost anybody on the street and ask them to recite Rustavelli and they can recite on and on and on until you ask them please to stop. They are very brisk. But I'm going to show you a different side of Tariel. Oh no. This is Tinatin. Sorry, we'll get to the other side of Tariel. So the Knight in the Panther Skin involves the story of four people, two women and two knights, two men. So um, one of the women is Tinatin. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Neston. This is Tariel's girlfriend. So we have Neston, and Tinatin would be the equivalent of Queen Tamar or the, the image I showed you before. Let's see if I can back that. This would be Tinatin. This is actually supposed to be a historical rendering of Queen Tamar, but Tinatin in the book is supposed to be her representative. And then we have Neston Darajan, the other woman. And she's one of these fierce women. She's the other side of the coin I talked about. So when Tariel, uh, when Neston's father gives her away in marriage to someone who is not Tariel, she says, what are you going to do about it? And he says, what can I do about it? The bridegroom is coming with 2,000 men, and there's going to be a wedding, and you're going to be married. And she says, you can do something about it. You can kill the bridegroom. And he says, OK. So he goes and he kills the bridegroom. <laughs> And that sort of perpetuates the story. But she's a very, very tough cookie. And she survives being put in a, her father's so angry when he finds out about her role that he puts her in a box and sends her out to sea. And she spends years in this box. That's Tariel on a bad day. <laughs> if you can see him there, this is when uh, he's, killed the, he's killed the panther, he's killed the lion. So he's famous for this scene. He, um, he, he describes what happened. He saw a, a lion chasing a tiger. And it's assumed that the lion is male and the tiger is female. So Tariel tries to reason with the lion. 
stop harassing that tiger. She doesn't like what your attentions, please stop. And the lion takes objection to this, so Tariel has to kill the lion. Then he tries to explain to the tiger that he's her helper and he wants to be friends, and the tiger doesn't like this very much, so he has to kill the tiger. And then he's kind of whipped potatoes after that. So this shows you Tariel just completely desperate and, and despondent. I, I, don't, I venture to say there's no image in all of literature showing one of King Arthur's knights in this position. And there's his best friend, Aftandil. Aftandil is the guy who goes in search of Neston for Tariel. This is Aftandil on his search for Neston on behalf of Tariel, and he meets a, a married woman, Patman, who is a very interesting character. She doesn't like her husband very much, and she's glad that her husband is away on a business trip. So she makes advances to Aftandil, and Aftandil is this noble knight who's so in love with Tina Tin that he wouldn't think of doing anything, but he thinks to himself that she could be very useful. If they make love, after you make love with a woman, she'll tell you anything. And Patman is a merchant's wife, so let's do this, but only for my girlfriend, Tina Tin. I'm still being pure to Tina Tin, but I'm doing this for her to get the story that I need. And so then, and then he describes, he's not very happy with uh, his uh, activity afterwards, he feels remorse, but he feels remorse because Patman is like a, is like a crow compared to Tina Tin, his nightingale. So here's the script. This is the beginning of the night in the panther skin. And uh, it's a very, very, the first quatrain, just to show you the thing and to show you the rhymes there that the, the ending, let me see, I'll try my thing. So here we have this eta. And here, eta, that this is the I again, the T from Tbilisi, and this is the A. So eta, 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 eta. So this whole epic, which is 1661 quatrains, Actually, we translated a few more because we added some from other versions, um, times four. So it's like 6,600, whatever, 24, some mathematician. But anyway, a lot of lines, and they all rhyme A, 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 B, 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 B. And they're all 16 syllable lines. And this form is a Persian form. It's a very old form. And it's known as Shairi, S-H-A-I-R-I. And uh, when I first started translating it, that was the question. Uh, was I going to try to do it in that form, or was I going to do it like previous, previous versions and do it in prose? And Rustavelli went on like this for 6,600 lines. Obviously, he wanted the poem to be in rhyme, and the music depends on the rhyme. So uh, although it was harder, uh, English has many more words than Georgian but it has fewer rhyme words, so that made it even more difficult. But this is the beginning. Oh, I don't need that. This is the translation of, so this is the rough, this is the Bitskarity translation. This is what, if you went through literally, he who created the world power, that mighty, heavenly creatures by soul, spirit. You see, it's sort of gibberish, but you get the idea. But this is telling you what each word, this is what I started from, was a Georgian Bitskarity. And uh, going through to the end. This is uh, what we call, I worked with Georgian native speakers and I couldn't have done it without them. I also, uh, at that point, I was able to read with great difficulty the, the written text, and I was able to recognize some words, and I began to sound it out. But the first thing that appealed to me about Rustavelli was the sound. Gia, my first uh, collaborator, read it out loud. So after we did the Bitskarity, we did an abracadabra translation, which means no attempt to make it beautiful, but just to make sense out of it. So he who created the world with his mighty power created the heavenly creatures from the sky by his soul. He blew into or inspired us men, gave humans the world we own of uncountable colors. From him is every king's face like unto God's. So that's the abracadabra. 
Here are the three major previous translations. Um, the big one, well, I like Venera Uoshadze because she has the Greek hexameter somewhere in the background. So, but let's start with Marjorie Wardrop. He who created the firmament by that mighty power made beings inspired from on high with soul celestial. To us men he has given the world, infinite in variety we possess it, from him is every monarch in his likeness. To me that sounds, and she was really trying hard in the first quatrain, but it sounds very flat-footed. It doesn't sound like a poem at all. It sounds like a sort of jumbled news report. Plus, there are some words that she gets wrong, like the word for here, you see in the uncountable colors. If you're calling, now it means, of course, she has variety. But if you're talking about a world of uncountable colors, I think you need to have colors in the translation. So she has that. Okay, then Dr. Marr, I won't even read that, but it's the same thing. I'll read the first one. He who by his mighty power created the firmament, breathed the celestial spirit from heaven, and made what is. So, okay. This is the, by far, to me, the best of these three. He who created the firmament by the omnipotent might of his power, gave breath to all living creatures and to man, spirit celestial, gave us the world to possess with all its unlimited varieties and kings ordained by him, each in his own image. Okay, that's, she's going Greek hexameter, it has six beats to the line and it has a certain rhythm to it, but she's missing a lot of things, especially the color again. So this is what I have. He who created heaven and earth, out of his power and might, inspired every earthly being with his Holy Spirit bright. Then reigning over the colorful earth became our human right, and in our ruler's faces we could see his image in plain sight. So I think you hear that, right? I hope you hear that music. And um, this went on to win the Saba Prize in 2016. Um, and uh, just for the record, I was, really happy because, uh, so my publisher was there, my, the person I worked with, the Dona Kaziria, who worked with me every step of the way, she was there. And they had, um, the way they work is they, they select, publishers send in nominations. And for, they had like 500 in nominations for their different categories. And so in our category, I think there were 26 nominations from publishers. And then what they do is they read everything and then uh, they have a committee that reads to and does finalists and they come up with four or five sometimes finalists. And then they have, again, another committee, another set of people that goes through and selects from the finalists. So as we were going through or sitting there, it was held outdoors at this big palace with TV lights and everything. And as we were sitting there, they showed videos. They had videos of all the finalists. And we were going through in the video of the finalists for literature, finalists for this. And my publisher turned to me and said, did they make a video of you? I said, no. Did they make a video of you? No. So we were wondering. And then, then they announced that I had won. And I asked afterwards. And they said, because of the translation and because of the nature of the work, that the committee that was called upon to designate five finalists said, we don't want to do that in this case. It has to be Lynn Coffin's translation. So I was like, okay. So that's why they didn't take a video of me. Okay. Um, I want to stop now for a second. Let's see. Video mute. And see if there's some questions. It's, I'm going to go on to talk a little bit more, but I could ask you if you have questions or comments. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So questions, please. Comments. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Don. Did you feel handicapped uh, by not being fluent in the language? When I think of someone doing a major translation and, uh, you know, you just assume that 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 person is fluent in the language with all of its nuances. It uh, sounds like it was a collaborative effort. Right, right. Okay, so there are a couple of, of course it was absolutely collaborative. I depended upon the native speakers and the scholars 
I depended on my publisher and other. But I'll tell you a story. I wondered about that myself. I'm now in the process of trying to learn Georgian. I'm continuing to translate Georgian poetry. My Georgian's getting better and better. I'm going back again this summer. So I do, I wish that I had known better Georgian. And when we do our revision, I'm sure that will come into play. But when I was uh, in my 20s, I translated a Czech poet named Yuzi Orten. I really recommend him to you. He's one of the world's greatest poets and virtually unknown anywhere, even in the Czech Republic. Name is Yuzi Orten, O-R-T-E-N. So uh, a Czech professor at the university came to me and said, you're an American poet. You should translate Yuzi Orten. He's great. So he found a native speaker for me, and working with her, we translated Orten's elegies. And I, 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 what I've since come to learn is to trust when I love the poet, it will go well. My worst translation, I think, is my translation of Seifert, Yaroslav Seifert, although that was used by the Nobel Committee in giving him his prize. But I didn't feel the resonance with Seifert. But I felt it very strongly with Orten. So we published this little book, the Michigan Slavic Publications published a little book of or 10 translations. And then I was assailed by doubts uh, 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 on this scale. Maybe I shouldn't have tried it. Maybe I should wait until I know Czech really well and I, should, I shouldn't have done this. This was, uh, this was wrong. And about four years, three or four years after I, I didn't translate anything after that, I got a letter in the mail out of the blue and it was from Yuzi Orten's brother. Yezhi Orten's brother was the closest person to Yezhi, and he spent the war years as an announcer at the BBC. So his English was very good. He was a native Czech speaker closest to Yezhi Orten. And he described to me, I was walking through Prague, and I was in a bookstore, and I didn't know anything about your translation, and I came across your translation. And I have to tell you that I can now die a happy man because these are the poems my brother would have written if he'd written in English. So I took that as a big pat on the back from the universe to go ahead. And um, I always tell people, I mean, Rustavelli is an incredible poet. He's an incredible storyteller. He's an incredible aphorism maker. He's, he's akin to Shakespeare, his breadth of his vision. And he's writing in the 12th century. It's just, it's fantastic. Uh, the, the men are so interesting and so feminine. The women are so interesting and so masculine. It's just a great story, beautifully told. I can't hope to equal that, but I can think I can do a much better job than the previous translations. So I had people, for example, in London Book Fair come up to me. And I remember one guy, and he was in his 20s, and he was the child of Georgians. They left Georgia when he was about seven. And he said, my, my parents are always raving about this book. And I tried to read Marjorie Wardrop, and I thought, what are you raving about? This is boring, it's flat-footed. Now I get it. Now I love Rustavelli. And so I remember that. So you're right. I mean, I, I hope I will translate better and better as my knowledge increases. But in the meantime, I do the best I can. And it did take a lot of collaboration, of course. But not only the Bitskarity. But Dodona would talk to me. She was the one who first explained about Shirey. I didn't know about Shirey. And she would talk about the customs of the day. She knew about the history. For example, I remember once I had Aftandil come up to the king and uh, start talking to him. And she said, no, you have to be lower than the king before you talk. You can't have him just come up. You notice in the text it says, you know, he sat. And so you have to have that, because otherwise you're in trouble. So it's a very good question. This is Ken. I have a question. It seems to me the choice of a translator is rather critical. How did you go about uh, choosing a translator? I'm the translator. <laughs> so just a bit. Right. So, um, well, I had worked with Dodona. There's a volume up here of uh, Georgian poetry from uh, Rustavelli to Galaktion. So the story is that. I was a, a Georgian scholar, a Brodsky scholar, found out that I spent two years as Joseph Brodsky's teaching assistant. And I wrote a memoir about this commission by the Hungarian Writers' Union. 
and he read it. It's online somewhere, I think. It's also here. And uh, he said it was the best thing he'd ever read about Joseph Brodsky, and he wanted to know more about me. So we got into a correspondence. This was 2005. And he sent me a little poem by Chav Chavadza, and he asked me to translate it. So I, he did the bits already. I translated. He said, you've got to come. So I came to Georgia without knowing a soul, not even knowing where I was going to live, not having met anybody there. It was a little scary. But I finally got there, and we started translating uh, Georgian poetry. And he said that we had to begin with Rustavelli. And I said, who was Rustavelli? And he said he was a 12th century monk. And I said, oh, God, no, do we have to start there? That's going to be so boring. He said, no, no, wait, wait. And so we started there. So I've worked with many. Right, right now, I'm translating a Georgian poet named Baratashvili. I was asked by the Museum of Literature. And I'm really pleased because the, the volume is going to be Baratashvili in Georgian, in Russian, translated by Boris Pasternak, and in English, translated by Lynn Coffin. I'm really thrilled to be in the same volume as uh, Bartoshvili and Boris Pasternak. But the, the, the short answer is I use native speakers. Sometimes I get more than one Bitskarity. But generally, if you think about it, there are some terms that are problematic. But a lot of terms are very easy. Like Mepa means king. So you, when you look at that, heaven means heaven. But there are some terms w that, that don't match. And that's where the problem comes in. And then I'll speak to a lot of different native speakers and try to get the best match. And sometimes there is no match. So, um, but uh, I worked in this case with a woman named Adona Kaziria. She's a professor at Indiana University. She's a poet in Georgian and in English. And we worked together on the Georgian anthology and we didn't get along at all. And I have to say, I don't really understand. So for example, at the very end, they, uh, she had written a very scholarly introduction to the book, and uh, they asked me to write a personal introduction. So I wrote a personal one-page thing about saying how much I love Georgia. And I sent it to Dedona, and I said, what do you think? And I didn't hear from her, and there was a deadline, so I sent it off. I said, if you don't like this, I won't use it, or I'll write something else. And I didn't hear from her. Sent it off, and the next day, I got a letter from her if you use this introduction, I'm going to quit. I'm not going to have my introduction. I'm pulling my name. I hate this introduction. What's the matter with you? You are arrogant. You just, and I was like dumbfounded. So I, I sent a letter to the, it, to the uh, Ithi not Ithaca, to the, uh, I forget the name of the publisher, at uh, Indiana University Slavica, and I said, uh, I'd like you to use this version of the book. I didn't even say what I was changing, but all I changed was taking out my introduction. So then I wrote her and I said, okay, it's out. Um, and, but really, I, don't, I wish you wouldn't be so angry and mad. And so she wrote me back and she said, you're right, I shouldn't get angry. But when I hear people like you, <laughs> so it, when it came time, we, we got the book done. When it came time to choose the person I'd be working with for Rustavelli, I was very hesitant, but I said, I, her knowledge is incomparable. She's the only one who can do this, who knows English so well, who knows Georgian so well. So I wrote her and I said, you know, please would you sign on with me and I will try my best. And we got along perfectly on Rustavelli. She was so supportive and so kind. I don't know what happened, but it's a miracle ch and it changed and everything was great. I visited, um, Georgia when it was part of the Soviet Union. And Tbilisi, to me, in those days, looked just like Ashland. And I have really fond memories that you said the people were generous. Someone, in, a man in our tour went to a shop and tried to buy some champagne. He had no rubles, he had to use dollars, and they couldn't, they weren't allowed to take the dollars at that time. People did anyway, but the shop didn't. They gave him the champagne. And then I went into a bakery. People were walking around eating. It wasn't the dessert you described. It was like a deep fried powdered sugar thing. They were eating these things. And so we went into the bakery and we asked if we could just buy like three for three of us. And they said, no, they couldn't just do that. So they gave them to us. And I, I just, uh, to me, I always think of Tbilisi as the people that are just really, really nice. 
Right, so with that, so you definitely should sign up for a tour or go and visit <laughs> Tbilisi. I, I, this, you know, everybody I think pretty much has the same experience of their generosity. Are there any other questions? In, in World War I, the uh, Armenians were forced out of their homeland by the Turks. Did, did uh, the Armenians move into that area then when they were forced out by the Turks? You know, I have no idea. I'm really sorry. My, the, my ignorance is astounding when it comes to history. And um, what I know about geography is on those two slides. <laughs> so I'm, I, I don't know, but that would be very interesting to find out. Um, this is Deanna. I'm just hoping that um, you might read some of the original poem in Georgian, just so we could hear how it sounds. Um, I, I would bit. hesitate. If, if I read the original in Georgian, you would not hear how it sounds. I can read my version. I would butcher it so much, because when I'm there, I have a passable Georgian. But when I've been out of the country and not speaking Georgian, I've been working with my, I have a baby grandson here in Salem, and uh, I've been spending days and nights with him. He's two weeks old. And I can't, I can, I can say gama joba, rova rachar. That's about it. Hi, how are you? Uh, I would not want to because it's so beautiful. But, but I think, I mean, I'm happy to read another quatrain of my translation. I could read a quatrain. Okay, so I'll, let me do that. So this is a description at the very end of the book. It was one of the hardest quatrains to translate. I got it. And um, it's a description of what, what, the, what, what a good kingdom looks like. So we have, two, we have two people who have become new kings. And Rustavelli is trying to sum up at the end of his book, what does a good kingdom look like? Their kingly mercy was given to all. It fell like endless snow. The poor stopped begging. Widows felt safe. And orphans were helped to grow. Evildoers were scared. Their ewes had lambs, but no milk to bestow. In the realm of their kingdoms, the goat with the wolf could safely go. Which I think is the end of the and the epilogue their tale is ended like a dream of the night they are passed away and gone beyond the world behold the treachery of time at play even to him who thinks it long it's just a moment it won't stay I a certain Meskian bard from Rustavi I've had my say Hi, over here, my name is Janet. I'm just fascinated with all of this, but could you explain a little of your process? Did you like spend an hour with a collaborator and then go home for an hour and try to make it rhyme? <laughs> and I just, okay. uh, uh, and then how long, you may have said this, but how long did it take you no, in that's, years? That's great, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said years, yeah. It took me two and a half years working almost every day to do the rough draft. And we, Dodona and I worked like this. She would write the Bitskaridi, like I showed you up here, the, the first one, the word for word translation. And then if, if she didn't feel that it was making enough sense, she would talk to me a little bit about what, uh, 
what, I, what she thought I needed to know in terms of cultural background, in terms of history. Then I would, my job was to get it into poetry, to have the sound, to capture the sound and the rhythm, to capture it. I'll tell you the hardest part, this is interesting to me, the hardest part of the two and a half years came at the end with English, <laughs> because every line needs to be 16 syllables. And I realized that in English, some words are, some authorities say two syllables and some say three. So is sovereign two syllables or three syllables? Some say sovereign, some say sovereign. Some say fires two, some say fires one. So here I am consulting these English authorities and I realized that my, my syllable counting in my own voice was irregular. So I had to go through and check all the syllable counts according to whatever authority I chose as, um, and the interesting thing, for example, sovereign, uh, I, I made a decision. It seems that the word sovereign, when it's, a, uh, when it's an, um, an adjective, is two syllables. It was their sovereign right. But if it's a ruler, if it's a noun, it seems like sovereign. She was the sovereign of England. He was the sovereign. So to me, uh, and that explained why some authorities said two and some said three. So in the night in the panther skin, wherever there's an adjective sovereign, it's two syllables. Wherever there's a noun, it's three. So I would take the Bitskarity and I don't know, again, that's where the love, I loved Rustavelli. I loved the story. I loved the poetry and I wanted to capture that. So you have, my grandchildren know this in, in Seattle. So. At the beginning of the book, the king is out hunting with Oftendil, and they see a knight in the panther skin, and he's crying. That's the first thing we meet the knight in the panther skin, and he's sitting by the river crying. So the king sends a slave to go and bring him and tell who he is. He doesn't want to come, so the slave comes back and says he won't come. So the king sends 12 slaves to go and bring him back. And he makes it clear that he doesn't want to be bothered. Just leave me alone. They won't leave him alone. So with his whip, he kills 11 of them. And the 12th goes running back wounded and tells the king that that didn't go very well. So the king sends 12 knights on horseback to go and confront him. And he makes it clear he doesn't want to be bothered. And they won't listen. So he takes out his whip and he kills 11 of them. And the 12th knight goes back and said that didn't go any better. So the king comes with all his retinue. He's gonna show this guy, and he comes with hundreds and everything, and the knight disappears. And that's how it begins. And then the king's daughter, Tinatin, she wants to know who this knight was. And so she sends her lover, Oftendale, well, he's not her lover yet, but anyway, she sends her would-be lover, Oftendale, out to find him. And it takes him three years. She gives him three years to find this mysterious knight. And at the end of the three years, like the last day, he sees three guys coming from this direction and they're all wounded and the middle one looks like he's gonna die. And he says, aha, I think I know. And these three guys set upon Tariel and tried to get him. Anyway, so Aptendil goes up to Tariel, he, but he doesn't approach him, he doesn't come close because he says, if I do, one of us is gonna die. And it's probably gonna be me, so I don't wanna do that. So he tracks Tariel back to a cave, and he discovers that Tariel's there with a woman who's helping him. So when Tariel leaves, he goes to the woman, and he says, tell me, or I'm gonna kill you. Tell me his story. All I wanna know is his story. I don't want anything else, no money, just his story. And the woman says, go ahead and kill me. You have to kill me if you want his story. So then he, what does he do? He starts to cry. And he says, oh, it's because I love this woman and she wants a story. And, that, and then Asma, the woman, starts to cry too. She says, oh, I didn't know. I'll help you. I'll be your helper. I'll make sure. And so she's, he says, what do I do? And she says, I'm going to hide you. So she hides him, his horse, his armor, everything in the cave, kind of a neat feat. And Teriel comes back and she says to him, you spend all your life with the animals. You, you're just a wreck. You, you need a, someone, a male companion to be your equal. He says, I know, I know, but where would I find such a person? He said, well, you know, if I should happen to find such a person who is your equal and everything and also had a love that he was, what would you do? And would you promise not to kill him? <laughs> Daria says, I would promise. She says, okay, come on out. <laughs> 
so that's the beginning of that story. Oh, this is Paul. Uh, I know in Western countries and also Russia, English is taught to all the uh, students as a second language. Is that the case in Georgia? So in terms of if you traveled there, there was you could communicate relatively easily since the language is so unique. Right. Yes, you can. And in fact, it's not just the students, but again, like with Russia, so, you know, English, well, you couldn't learn English, you had to learn Russia. So there's this big wave of popularity and there's a thriving business. Georgians, there are almost no teachers of Georgian, but there are teachers of English everywhere, and Skype and so forth. So not just the students in the school, but everywhere, they want to learn English, they want to speak English. So I had to search very hard. I was trying to find somebody that I could stay with who didn't speak English. It was a very hard struggle. I like to find people who don't speak English because then I really get a chance to practice my Georgian. Um, but it, yes, you certainly can in Tbilisi. And the road signs, the bus stops, they have a wonderful bus system and all the bus stops are in English. The flash is Georgian, then English, Georgian, English. So you can get along perfectly well. And uh, maybe learn a few words of Georgian. <laughs> Hi, this is Solveig. Um, so is it English English or American English that you focus on? Well, that's a good question. It started out, uh, I have to say this, that it started out all the teaching was in English English. But now American English is just much, much cooler. Everybody wants to know American English. Yes, because English, you know, English, forget about them, Brexit, you know, forget their, their, what are they doing? But America has the rock, America has jazz, America has the cool, uh, and America, according to Georgia, I mean, most Georgians, for reasons that are debatable, many, many Georgians would like to come here. And they'd like to come here, their idea is to come here, stay here for years, make a lot of money, and then go back to Georgia. <laughs> um, but they have a, a very, un, I've traveled, as I said, a lot of different places, and in my experience, Georgia is one of the very few pockets where Americans have a very good reputation. Most places I have traveled, that is not true. In fact, it can be lethal, can be dangerous. But in Georgia, America still is the hero. All right, why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break. Great. So I had a very interesting question right at the end of break. Somebody said, how did Georgia get the name Georgia? And uh, I gave her a very good answer. I have absolutely no idea. Um, the Georgian word for Georgia is Sakartvelo. Sakartvelo is the name. Thank you. Um, but you, for a good question, is there any uh, other tail end of a question before I start on something very different? You have wonderful, yeah. Can we? This is Peter. Why do so many Georgian names end in Ashvili? Okay. That's a good question. I was just saying to her, you know it's Georgian name if it ends in Shvili. Shvili means child of. <laughs> so it's like Jen's, all the sons, but they're more democratic. Shvili could be male or female. In fact, one of the wonderful things, there's a book of here, and my favorite Rustavali aphorism says, lions, whelps, Lions' offspring are equally lions, whether male or female they be. And for a 12th century man to say this, I think was pretty remarkable. <laughs> and he shows it throughout his book, that he feels that way, that he feels that the women are equal to the men and they have an equal say. They're, very, they're more the decision makers. Nestan is more a decision maker than Tariel is. Uh, so that's just worth mentioning. Anything else? Okay, because we're embarking on English poetry now. Uh, so this is, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the beginnings of English poetry. And then, um, so does anybody know the first English poet? No, that's a good guess. Beowulf is the name of the epic that came later, but the first English poet was named Cadman. And I'm going to tell you the story that I learned, then I'm going to show you the official 
thing. But the story I learned about Cadman was he was working in the barn. He was mucking out stalls, and an angel appeared to him and said, Cadman, sang may wat wugu. Sang may wat, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had anybody show up and say, sang may wat wugu. But this, this happened, this angel showed and sang me wat wugu means sing me something, whatever you choose, wat wugu. And Cadman replied, it kind of nok sing on. I can't sing. And the angel said, and she began with the, the, my favorite word in all of English, English, wathra. Wathra means nevertheless, but it's very, very strong, never, no matter what, nevertheless, wathra. Thou mayak may sing on. Nevertheless, you may sing to me. And so he began to sing, and he became the first English poet. This is uh, during the year 657 to 68, probably near the beginning of that. And this story is told by the Venerable Bede in the 8th century. Um, and Cadman later, they say, became a monk and a poet. And here's the marker to Cadman, to the glory of God and in memory of Cadman. The father of English sacred song fell asleep hard by, I used to worry about this, I, didn't, I thought it was G80, but it's 680 is the year when he, when he died, which is coincidentally the end of the abbess. So before I, Flash to the next slide. There is an English, one of the very English, or early English poems is called The Battle of Malden. And it's remarkable, and it's uh, memorialized by one of the very early English poems. And one part of that, one quatrain goes like this. He shall the herdra, herta the kenra, mod shall the mara, the ura, megan, litlot. Okay. One more time. It's, you can recognize about two thirds of it if you be flexible. Higa shall the herdra, herta the kendra, mod shall the mara, the ura megan litlath. So higa means higher. Higa shall the hedra, the head. I will hold our heads higher. Harta, herta, the heart, the kendra, the keener. So our heads will be higher, our hearts will be keener. Mode is the original word for mood, but in those days it meant like our attitude, our, our mood in a big sense, not mood like I'm in a bad mood, but mood. Mode shall the mara, our mood, our determination shall be more, the order megan litlat, the more we get slaughtered. So it's about, okay, this is not, no, this is Cadman's hymn. I'm sorry, we got a mix up in slide order, so I hope I remember what this is. This is Cadman's hymn. Holy creator, warden of men, first for a roof or children of earth. He established the heavens and founded the world and spread the dry land for the living to dwell in. Lord everlasting, almighty God. Now, the interesting thing about this is it predates, but it has the two stress, it's a two stress line. And if you put two of those together, it makes a four-stress line, and that's what most English poetry came to be and what we came out of. This is the site of the Battle of Malden, and this is Earl Brithnoth. On the 10th of August, 19, 991, he lost. <laughs> he was creamed. Everybody was killed. I think it's remarkable. Why do we have a sign, you know, on this date, everybody was slaughtered and defeated because of the poet, the Battle of Malden. We don't know his name, but here it is. He shall the herdra, herta the kendra, mod shall the mara, the ura megan lidlat. And then it says, here lies our Lord, all, all destroyed, uh, a good, good man in the earth. But I love this, God on grit. So a good guy gone or something. Uh, and this is a four stress, it's called four stress alliterative meter. So it's higa, higa shall the herdra, herta the kendra, mod shall the mara, the ura megan, litlat. And then I won't do the other. So 
the idea of forced stress alliterative measure that is sort of in our birthright, it's in our bones, is you have a sound, in this first line it's H, he, and then you have at least one of that sound after the caesura. Caesura is the pause or the break in the line. So in order for it to be four stress alliterative measure, it has to have four beats to the line, and it has to have at least one sound from the beginning that's echoed in the end. So here is mod chaldamara, the ura megan lidla. So it has the M sound. So that's our four stress alliterative measure. And I just think it's it testifies to the power of poetry that because of this long poem about the Battle of Malden, and it describes how these men were overwhelmed by the Danish raiders and how they were defeated and how they kept dying and, they, and the, the more they died, the more the whatever remnant was left was all emboldened. It reminds me of, uh, somebody mentioned in a break that some of Rustavelli sounds like a soap opera. Uh, you know, where the uh, this, this sort of improbable uh, drama that's kind of half tragic and half humorous. There's a version of this, uh, I can't think of his name. There's a version of this uh, when, the, when the Greeks were chasing the Persians out of Greece. And uh, the ships were already set sail, but one guy was so overwhelmed with his battle enthusiasm that he ran out to the ships and he was trying to, I don't know, kill some of the Persians that were leaving. And he had his arm up and they cut off his arm. So he, according to the legend, they, they cut off his other arm because he wouldn't quit and then they cut off his, both his legs. Anyway, it was, but it was showing this sort of zealous uh, soap opera enthusiasm for the battle and he finally died and completely unnecessary. But this is uh, uh, to show you how the poetry can do a story of defeat and make it a heroic defeat. And so that years afterwards people will remember, I, you know, I hope that, that this is just uh, known. Okay, now this is, now we're switching, going over hundreds and hundreds of centuries. And this is my poem called Oedipus and the Sphinx. And I'll read it to you a, a little bit. He stopped in mid-stride. Her blue flame eyes were so pure they made him recall childhood, long days spent with shepherds in the mountains near home. While the sheep grazed like clouds that had found their legs, he lay back, amazed that his royal body could so adapt itself to the common ground. Now it was all he could do to stand his ground. Her eyes reduced past and future to so much ash, so much wood to burn. Her body seemed puzzled together, china doll face, long snowy wings, woman's breasts, the trunk, tail, and legs of she lions. She was keeping him from home, from the city he'd chosen at his new home. While he watched, she lowered herself to the ground, tucked her little girl face between those hind legs, and sniffed the blood that leaked from her like so much milk. She licked her soft gray parts a long time and nosed over the rest of her body. A sour milk came from her body. Something, not fear, made him sorry he'd left home. The priests had delivered themselves of a long, tedious lecture. Be silent, stand your ground, they'd said. If you try speaking first, as so many men have done, she'll sprout two more legs from her belly and using those new legs like arms strangle you, then tear your body into small pieces as though it were so much soft bread. If you want to reach your new home, wait for her riddle. He stood his ground until his bad foot seemed on fire from the long ordeal. The sun was setting and the long day nearly done, when head snaking from her legs, she asked the riddle. He sank to the ground and shouted out the answer. Her body shaking, she waited for his sword to strike home. Later, some claimed his answer killed her. Not so. From the ground, he thrust his long sword home between her legs. Her body might have survived that, so he'd poisoned the blade with his father's blood. Okay. 
you know the, the legend of Oedipus and the Sphinx, I hope. That, uh, so in essence, the Sphinx is, uh, so Oedipus uh, was taken by his mother and father. He had a bad leg. He limped. That's why he's called Oedipus. And he was taken and put on the hillside to die because he was compromised. And a shepherd found him, took him away, took him to another uh, country, another kingdom, and he was adopted by the king and queen. So he's going along, he gets to be a man, and he goes to the Oracle of Delphi. It's a wonderful place. If you haven't been, you should definitely go. Anyway, he goes to the Oracle of Delphi and asks for, you know, sort of a prediction or what, what's going to happen. And the, the Oracle says, you're going to kill your father and marry your mother. He's not very happy about this, as you can understand. So he decides, which is always bad, that he's going to kind of circumvent the prediction by not going home. If he never sees the king and queen again, how can he kill his father and marry his mother? Because he loves them both very much, and he's not going to do that. So he's going along, and he's kind of upset by what the oracle has said. And this carriage comes down and is too close to the shoulder of the road and is kicking up dust, and he gets really mad, and he kills the guy in the carriage. And the guy in the carriage was his biological father. So like half an hour after the prediction, he kills his father. Then he goes to the town, and he, on his way, there's the Sphinx. So he answers the riddle of the Sphinx, which is what goes on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three in the evening. You know the answer, right? It's a person, right? So crawling as a child, then as a man walk, or a woman walking upright, and then with a cane. Okay. So he answers that, and he's, so, he's a big hero because now the city is freed from the Sphinx, and so they all want him to marry the queen, and so he marries the queen, who is his mother. So this is the riddle. So this is the background of this poem. Um, do you notice anything about the form of the poem? So just anything that strikes you. I mean, is it free verse? I mean, obviously, it doesn't look like free verse. Yeah. Right, right. So the last, so one thing is, you notice, where am I? Where is the, the ground is repeated here. Home is repeated here. Anything else you notice? It's worth, okay, let's look at this one. So we have the same thing here, legs, legs, long, long. What about this one? This doesn't have that. What does it have, though? OK, I'll give you the answer is right there. So this, this is, how many lines are there in each verse? Six. OK, Italian word for that is sesta. So this is a sestina. This is one of the uh, old troubadour forms of your, I, I love this form. And it's not just this, ground, ground, but notice body body, legs, legs, home, home, so, so, long, long. It only has six words. Every line ends with one of these six words. And not only does every line end with one of these six words, just to make it interesting. See, here are the six words, so, long, home, legs, body, and ground. Here's the first set, so long. These are, the, these are the words that end the first six lines. Then you have the ground repeated. And you go, it's, a very, it's like a bicycle lock. So you go six, one, five, two, four, three. Then you take this as this. Then you go six, one, five, two, four, I mean, it's a four, three. Then you take this as one. Do you see it? So what I mean? It's absolutely mathematical. So each stanza has to end with these, leg, these words in exactly this order. And then what about the last three? What happens there? Is it called a tercet? It's the final three lines of the poem. Something very interesting. Well, is, what about ground? Is ground there? Yeah, from the ground. What about long? Is long there? Yes, long sword. What about home? Home. So what, you, what, what it is is in the three lines, you have three lines to use all six words.
So I like that form. So you have so long, home, legs, body, and ground. But what I thought I wanted to do with this was to use all six in the first two lines of the tercet so that the last line is completely new. So the last line has none of the repeated lines. So to me, that was like a way of underscoring the fact that this is something, he's done something. He's poisoned the blade with his father's blood. He's done something that breaks with all tradition as a shock. It's a whole new beginning. But this is called a sestina, and it goes like that. Do you get what I'm saying? That I'm not sure. So you, if you take this, it's the A, B, C, D, E, F. That's what the A, B, C, D, E, F. Then if you take this last one and put it first, the first one and put it second, so it goes from the end to the beginning, from the end to the beginning, from the end to the beginning, and then it does the same thing here. C, F, D, A, B, E. You see that? That's really kind of neat. So that's a sestina. OK, this is another poem. And these are in uh, This Green Life, my collection of new and selected poetry, which is based on like eight books, I think. Uh, I had a friend say that he liked the book, but he said it was too skimpy. You should have had more poems in it. <laughs> but those were the poems that I really vouched for. A life. That's more like it, I finally heard him say. I'd do without the forceps if I could. As I relaxed, I felt the world give way. At 10, I slipped out after dark to play. Father didn't hit me, though he thought he should. That's more like it, I finally heard him say. At 20, I had a stage lover. I lay trembling in his arms in a cardboard wood. As I relaxed, I felt the world give way. We married. For 10 years, he managed to stay faithful. When he erred, I said I understood. That's more like it, I finally heard him say. At 40, beds got blanketed with gray. I wanted to die gracefully if I could. As I relaxed, I felt the world give way. I dream of God, discover I can pray, can be obedient for my own good. That's more like it, I finally hear him say. As I relax, I feel the world give way. OK, what about the form of this? You see the form of this? Yeah. OK, the last word? OK, what, what are we? So there's a lot of repetition going on, right? So does anybody know the name of this form? Um, this, the most famous example is do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. This is called a villanelle. And in a villanelle, what you do is, this is line one. That's more like it, I finally heard him say. This is line, the line, second repeated line. As I relax, I felt the world give way. Then you have a new stanza and repeat line one. That's more like it. Then you have second stanza and repeat this repeated line two. Then you have a third stanza, repeat it. Fourth stanza, repeat it. So those two lines, one and three, get repeated over and over. One, three, one, three. And then in the end, you said, I dream of God these two new lines, and then the re repetition of one and three, so that you're back at the beginning. But you put the words together, so it me makes a new meaning by putting them together. See, it's so my goal in doing this is just to suggest, um, I write a lot of free verse as well, but our roots in English poetry are in form. They're in rhyme. And uh, sometimes form can be really, really tricky and can be the, the essence and the, really the thing that makes, this, makes it work. So this is a very depressing poem, I have to say. But, uh, but at least it gives you the whole thing. And there's a, a chronological thing, 10, 20, 30, 40, that goes with it as well. So OK. This, uh, this is for my son, an old snapshot for Chris. Caught in the picture's network of gray cells, he trails his hand on the sandbox, and the rude gun of the future clicks empty. I see, I hear, ring bright stone skip, 
clip the wave that swells, surrendering to this pale shore. That's a mistake, to be sure. The well-knit memories leap at me like boys from docking boats. I elude the sea's green stare and watch the white floats. Knees, knuckles were knobs on sturdy limbs. It stays light so long in summer. On the green lawn out back, legs flicked up like rabbit ears, then they vanished forever. Pins, needles of light may still scatter, but the green and white days are gone. Knowledge has bright pages like the book of Kells, yet we are caught in a network of gray cells. OK, what about form for this? So I think you can see there's rhyme right now. Why is everybody so very quiet? There's rhyme, right? So you've got cells, swells, the sea, knit, this, it, boats, floats. It's an irregular rhyme pattern. Uh, but the, the key thing, I think, at the end is that it's, there's a couplet here. It's just like a Shakespearean sonnet. So a Shakespearean sonnet is 14 lines with a rhyme pattern and then has a couplet at the end. It's a harder form than the Italian sonnet, which doesn't have that couplet. So a one thing this is is a, is a Shakespearean sonnet. But what else? There's a form, there's a principle that anybody can get right away. Say it? Yeah, OK, that's good. So you have that. But look at the first lines. Look at the first letters of the first of the lines. Yeah, what do you see? Right. It spells out my son's name, Chris Miksovsky. <laughs> this is my little tribute to him. Do you see that? Chris, C-H-R-I-S, M-I-K-S-O-V-S-K-Y. That's his name. So I like to, when I'm writing poetry, I challenge myself with these mathematical conundrums and restrictions to try to work within, and I think it makes the poetry stronger. Um, anything else I want to say like that? No, OK. OK. This is a fun one. The dish ran away with a spoon. I've come back to the barn where I started. Though I rolled door to door in porcelain poses, I was dry as a bone. Now I'm cereal hearted. My early designs look like secondhand roses. Though I rolled door to door in porcelain poses, propelled by your stainless steel descriptions, my early designs look like secondhand roses. My now sanguine flowers have Greek inscriptions. Propelled by your stainless steel descriptions, I tried to kick the traces and clear the moon. My now sanguine flowers have Greek inscriptions, yet I played second fiddle in your nursery tune. I tried to kick the traces and clear the moon. I forgot cow-eyed nature. I dreamed Pegasus dreams, yet I played second fiddle in your nursery tune. My fine china life came apart at the seams. I forgot cow-eyed nature. I dreamed Pegasus dreams. I was dry as a bone. Now I'm cereal hearted. My fine china life came apart at the seams. I've come back to the barn where I started. And I think you can pick up that. So this is a, it's called a round or a pontoon, P-A-N-T-O-U-M. And this has the repeated lines. Everything is repeated. So this one, one and three, I'm sorry, two and four. Though I roll door to door becomes down here, one. And then line four, my early designs, becomes line three. And then you add two new lines. So this propelled becomes an, is a new line. And this is a new line. And then those get repeated. So propelled down here. And then you add it and so forth. So it goes on like this, back and forth, back and forth. And then I like the idea of uh, having a theme of rolling, rolling, and then coming back to the barn where you started on a poem that kind of rolls like a circle and then comes back to the beginning. Okay, And we can go back to these if you want. OK, now I'm coming. This is the last thing I'll talk about. This is a, a paradel by Billy Collins. It's called Paradel for Susan. And Billy Collins invented this form uh, from the troubadours, uh, from the early Languedoc school, in which you take a line and you repeat the, repeat the line exactly the way it is another line repeated exactly as it is. And then you use only the words from those two lines 
I remember the quick, nervous bird of your love, and always perched on the thinnest, highest branch. You take those words, and those words only, scramble them, and make the end. Thinnest love, remember the quick branch. So here, I'm going to read this, but listen to what happens to this poem. Paradell for Susan by Billy Collins. I remember the quick, nervous bird of your love. I remember the quick, nervous bird of your love. Always perched on the thinnest, highest branch. Always perched on the thinnest, highest branch. Thinnest love, remember the quick branch. Always nervous, I perched on your highest bird, the. It is time for me to cross the mountain. It is time for me to cross the mountain and find another shore to darken with my pain and find another shore to darken with my pain. Another pain for me to darken the mountain and find the time cross my shore to with it is to. The weather warm, the handwriting familiar, the weather warm, the handwriting familiar. Your letter flies from my hand into the waters below. Your letter flies from my hand into the waters below. The familiar waters below my warm hand into handwriting. Your weather flies, you letter the from the. And then you take all the words of the poem for the last stanza. I always cross the highest letter, the thinnest bird, below the waters of my warm, familiar pain. Another hand to remember your handwriting. The weather perched for me on the shore. Quick, your nervous branch flew from love. Dark in the mountain, time and fine was my into it was with two two. Okay, so I came across this, and here was the note. The paradel is one of the more demanding French fixed forms, first appearing in the Languedoc love poetry of the 11th century. It is a poem of four six-line stanzas in which the first and second lines, as well as the third and fourth lines of the first three stanzas, must be identical. The fifth and sixth lines, which traditionally resolve these stanzas, must use all the words from the preceding lines and only those words. Similarly, the final stanza must use every word from all the preceding stanzas and only those words. Okay. And I thought, what's going on? Well, it was Billy Collins' idea of a joke. He doesn't believe in form, or not much form. And so he created this impossible form, gave it a fake pedigree, and set it out there. And, and then, you know, my into it was with two, two. What? But I thought, you could write a poem like that. You could write a poem, and it could make sense. It would take a lot of work. but. This is my paradel on love. And I did one other thing. Rather than just repeat the line, I changed the line, the order of the words, so it's a little bit less boring, more interesting. Once our hearts were open, we made love. We made love once our hearts were open. We turned and embraced in huge, unmade spaces ruined by war. Unmade, we turned and embraced in huge spaces ruined by war. Once we turned and embraced open war in huge spaces we made, our hearts were ruined by unmade love. Have you vanished from the face of this life? You have vanished from the face of this life. Still, I miss longing and belonging to you to have love. I still miss longing to have love and belonging to you. I have vanished from life to miss this longing, and still you have the face of love belonging to you. Our old blind pain did not help us find a way to God. Our old pain did not help us find a way to blind God. God could not let us be true to one another. One God could not let us be true to another. Let us find another, a blind God, to be true to. Our old one-way pain God did not, could not help us. Our blind way of belonging to old war turned our hearts, spaces, to pain. We once embraced a love and could have vanished from another God to find the one true face to help us. You were not open, God. You did not let be and have ruined us. And in this unmade life, made huge by longing, I still miss love. OK, so I don't want to do that yet. Uh, let me see if I can, oh no. Well, let me just, so um, 
I wanted to say, just say one thing about this. I read this, I was a contestant at the Bart Baxter Performance Poetry Contest in Seattle, and I was a finalist. I don't know if you know how this, the performance, they do a kind of slam where they have pages, and two poets get up, and then each one reads a poem, and then the judges vote for one or the other as the bet better of the two poets. So you, one, like I was blue, so you have two blue or one blue and two red. So it got down to me and one other guy, and he read a poem, uh, and then it was my turn, and I read this poem. And everything hung in the balance, because I knew I was slightly ahead of him going into the final turn. And I read to the, this part down here, uh, somewhere we, we once embraced a love and could have vanished from another god, and I couldn't, I blanked. I couldn't remember what came next. And I thought of, I could see on the table, right over there, I could see the paper with a poem on it, but I knew if I went and got the paper, that would be the end of it, because my performance would be. So I just stood there for a while, and then I went, you, and went on, you did not let be, and it ruined us. And in this unmade life, made huge by longing, I still miss love. And I got all votes. And later somebody told me, so I won the competition, and it was unanimous. And afterwards, somebody said, you know, I, was, I could tell. I was so moved. You were so emotional at the end. I saw how you <laughs> and you, <laughs> and I was thinking, no, I just couldn't remember the next damn line. <laughs> but anyway, so this, to me, shows you, I mean, this, if I had a sheet, which I apparently didn't get translated, but I did follow all his instructions. This, I counted out everything. I had a list of words. A, A, and, by, from, and I made sure that every word is there once, then repeated at the end of the stanzas, and then repeated. So every word, no matter what it is, has to be there at least three times. So pain is there three times. Well, you know, some of them are there six times, but you have to have at least three times. So you can just see. Um, so you see, like, once, I mean, I won't go through what, um, once, once, our, find our, our hearts, 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 were, were. So it all works in the last stanza. And if you get a book and you can count it and see that it's absolutely true. OK, so then I want to do this. This is, a, I'll close with this. This is one of my most popular poems that have been translated into many languages. And uh, I, I really like it because it's uh, more optimistic than some. Let me just say there's a formal thing that you might be able to recognize now. This poem is like another poem that we've seen. Can you tell what it is? Well, it's kind of like Shakespeare and Stonnet, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's a little short for Shakespeare and Stonnet. It does have the rhyme scheme. But what else does it have that ever, everyone can see? P, H, O, M, A, S. Thomas Carley. So it's an acrostic as well as a, as a, okay, so this is the acrostic, February. The snowman has crumbled to a giant's glove. Have I made it to garaged boots and boxes of five cent valentines? Do you love me now, me? Do you dream us into bed, young somehow and naked? Then what happens? Do your dry senses swing open like garden gates? I can feel you quicken when I touch you by accident the way I have to. I feel new repertoires come into play each time I do. Lift me up, breathe on my hair, and carry me. I'm five years old asking you to marry me. OK, thanks. Let's get some questions now. Thank you. Hello, this is Bob. Um, I applaud your um, 
use of form. I, I miss it. I, I, I sometimes feel like blank verse seems lazy. Like what? Blank verse sometimes seems lazy. And I think uh, you've dem you demonstrate with your own poetry um, <clears throat> that the form can contribute a lot to a lot of things, rhythm, the sound, the meaning. Um, but here, here's the question I have, and I saw it in uh, Billy Collins. Do you find sometimes that the, 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 the formal uh, structure that you've chosen uh, challenges your meaning? And how do you deal with form bending your meaning in order to capture a certain rhythm or, or to maintain a certain rhythm or a certain rhyming scheme? Uh, that's an excellent question. Did, did you all hear the question? Okay, so um, I, I wanted you to say no so that we could have a little more time to think about what I wanted to <laughs> So one thing I would say is that uh, the biggest mistake that people make starting out writing poetry is writing in rhyme. And they, you know, it gets to be doggerel or gibberish and they're writing in rhyme and they twist things like you said. For me, when I start writing a poem, I don't know the meaning. The meaning is discovered as I write the poem. Let me do something here. Uh, I had one poem. I'm going to read this because it's, it's, it doesn't have rhyme. It doesn't have a form. Uh, and it came to me in a dream. And I think it's one of the best poems that I've written. I read it for the Seattle City Council. Uh, and it's absolutely true, but I, I woke up in the morning and uh, the poem was almost perfectly there. I had another experience like that when my mother died. I wrote uh, the music box to her and but I really I wanted to read this so that you'll see that it's not just form. Here we go, 75. So this is called The Reception Line. Last night I dreamt about Aunt Percy the spunky al alcoholic I so loved for being who she was, funny and flawed. Leaving a bar one night when she was young, she rammed her car into a back road bridge abutment, then made her way in heels to the closest farm and called the police, complaining that someone had moved the bridge. <laughs> Aunt Percy Old was in my dream's reception line. She offered apricots cold and sweet. Aunt Percy, I said, you look wonderful, but thin, she said, and it wasn't good. A question came up. Someone in the family needed immediate help. Don't worry, I said, which is almost always a mistake. I think dream talking with the dead may be a sign my own death's not far off, and there's little time for me to tell it like I think it is which is the farthest honesty can take us while we breathe. In the dream, I spoke to my father and was glad to see him looking well. The last real time was in a Scottsdale hospital. I went in as soon as the nurses were done with bathing and shaving and feeding him. Garbled as he was, he got out my name and mumbled something about feet and cold. I rubbed his feet till he signaled me to stop left a picture of my mother by his bed and walked back to his nearby empty house, meaning to return after lunch. I was hardly in the door when the hospital called. In the dream, my father too was standing in the reception line. He looked happy and healthy. I said I was glad to see him. Then I added, speaking from someplace deeper than memory, you're my father among other things. When I woke up, I knew. My father's love was like a ship, and the ship wrecked and went down, and wood floated to the shore of the island of my life. And I picked up all the timber I could and used it for fires when the nights were cold. When we die, it doesn't matter what we had, only what we did. You may, like me, be so close to the edge, your feet are beginning to get cold. 
your dead too may have formed a reception line and so many in our family need immediate help. So that's the way it came. That's the way it came. And when I started writing the Paradell, I didn't know what would come. Um, so Lynn, my name's Elaine Smith, but I, may, I was here, but I may not have heard it. I just wanted you to tell a little bio about yourself. Um, I mean, maybe it doesn't have to be that one page bio that you had to take out of the book, <laughs> but just something about yourself and your history so that you can share it with others. I could go home and Google it, but I'd rather you share it with all of yeah, us. Yeah, please, please do Google. I, I have posted a lot of stuff on Google. One thing that I'm, uh, was kind of risky, and I'm very glad I did, I posted a thing on uh, a website, and it's called Suicide Survivor. And it's uh, talking about me as a, I tried to kill myself any number of times when I was young. And I'm talking to people about um, not doing that. <laughs> And I'm talking about based on uh, the fact of a lack of imagination. Uh, I, uh, when I was trying to kill myself, I couldn't imagine myself any different than I was then. Nobody said to me, imagine if you become a grandmother. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to kill a grandmother. So uh, I didn't have the imagination anyway, I wrote that. So my, I have a very uh, tangled uh, career um, I at one point was, uh, had many hospitalizations and depression. I don't, I've, well, I don't know, say conquered that. I have that. I'm the least depressed person that I know. I'll say that. And uh, I have a couple things I'm happy to write to people about that and talk about that. Um, I've had these books, uh, most of the 33 books or whatever that I've had uh, have been done by small presses. Uh, when I won, uh, for example, there's a book here, short stories, the first honeymoon, and uh, there's a story in there that won uh, best. It was in Best American sto Short Stories, judged by Joyce Carol Oates, and I got to meet her, and she told me how much she liked my story. So, um, you know, I've, I've sort of hobnobbed with a lot of famous people, and uh, I like the byline that's up there that I'm the most famous writer you've never heard of, and I think that's pretty. I think that's sort of true. Um, I live in Seattle. I've lived in New Orleans. I've lived in abroad. I go to Georgia. I, now I'm trying to set up a regular thing to go twice a year uh, because I feel so at home there. And one thing that's interesting to me, the problems there are much worse in the sense that most people I know are having to work two or three jobs just to feed their families. And they live in places that are falling down and uh, they're worried about Russia invading, uh, which is a, a sound worry. American corporations give their people uh, exit visas to Azerbaijan in case Russia comes in and they can get across the border. So, but the stress level is much lower than it is here for me. When I come here, I'm hit with such a wave of stress and anxiety, and I feel myself, I think I'm a much better person in Georgia. I think I'm more relaxed, less stressed. And I, like, I remember like the first day I was here, and uh, I was on the phone to the bank about my, uh, my, my account, and uh, they asked me for my card number. I didn't have it uh, handy, so I said, can I do something else? They said, give us your social security number, the woman said. So I gave her my social security number, and she said, okay. Now we have a few security questions we have to ask you. What are the last four digits of your social security number? And I was like, oh, I just, and she said, well, we have our security procedures and we have to. And to me, and like in Georgia, I rented an apartment. I rented an apartment. Uh, I wasn't sure how long I'd be there, but it was $300 a month. Beautiful apartment, I, well, very nice apartment. And I said, well, how much is it per week if I just take it for one week? She looked at me, she didn't understand. She said, $75. The concept of you charge 125 for one week, and she didn't have that in mind. And I said, okay, when can I move in? She said, oh, now, would you want to move in now, tomorrow, whatever. So I moved in, and then a couple of days later, she showed up, and she said, do you have some of the money? I said, sure, here's $300, she said, thank you. It was nothing about if you break the television, you're 
liable and, you know, signing your, I don't know, I don't, Georgians are, they don't have checks, which is sort of interesting. They have no checks. You can't pay for anything by check. Um, so it's all like cash or whatever. I don't know what it is, but for me, the, about my life, it's been a series of travels, series of ups and downs, and now I'm very blessed to have five grandchildren that I love, and the new one is just a, a, just a dear and so different from his older brother, who's three years old and keeps wanting to kiss him. Today, he got reprimanded because he wanted to put his finger, he started putting his finger in his little brother's mouth, and of course, that was not good, and then he got very upset that we reprimanded. <laughs> You know, we, I mean, not, not reprimanded like we got mad at him, but just said, no, you can't do that. And that was very upsetting. So I'm very involved in the life of my children and grandchildren. And I like living in Seattle. I like hiking. And, but I, I wish, like somebody suggested me, just take your family and move them all to Georgia. <laughs> I might do that. <laughs> Uh, what's the weather like in Georgia? Can you compare it to any of the weather we have in uh, this country? Yeah, well, I used to compare it to Seattle and say it was about the same as Seattle, but I was in Georgia for three months, January, February, and March. It was the wettest Seattle has ever been. I got home, people were just sick of rain and drizzle and gray. We had one bad day in Tbilisi, January, February, March, one bad day where it wasn't good to be out. It was sometimes a little colder, sometimes a little warmer, but just beautiful. So. You know, the planet is changing, the weather is changing, but it's basically the same, like the same as Seattle without all the rain. <laughs> By the way, Seattle has less rain than Dallas. Did you know that? All right, we thank you very much. Extraordinary.